I'm starting verse 2 of Genesis 15. And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, meaning he doesn't have any children. And lo, one born in my house is my heir. Abram is telling God, I have no children. And what I have, <clears throat> and when I die, I only have, my stuff is going to my servant. That's what he's saying. And in verse 4, he says, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This child, this shall not be thy heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thy heir. So God's telling him, This servant is not going to be your heir, Abin, Abram. He's calling him Abram right now. He said, "This is not your servant is not going to be your heir." He says, "There's going to come one that's going to come from you." And God said, "You will have a son." And we'll find out later, he did have a son, and his name was Isaac. Isaac did become the heir of all Abram had, and Isaac was a was a mighty man, Christian man. But now Abram, because of the covenant he has with the Lord, with God, now, like I said before, like I showed before, your children are in the covenant also. So Isaac will be in this covenant with the Lord because his father went into covenant with God. And it goes on down. Verse 5, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stores, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. The Lord showed Abram all the stores in the skies and said, there are so many stores you can't count them. And he says, this is how many children you're going to have. He's telling Abraham that. The, the word seed in verse 5 means people. But when we read Genesis, back in Genesis chapter 22 verse 18, it's speaking to Abraham, God speaking to Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. This seed means Jesus. He's, now in this seed, he's talking about Jesus. Also in Galatians 3.16, God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. And notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children, as if it meant many descendants. Whether it says to his child. And that, of course, means Christ. There's times he was talking about seed, Jesus, and then he talks about seed, the children of Abraham. But this is the same seed that was promised to, to Eve in the garden. The same seed. In Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the seed here, again, is talking about Jesus. I right? just want to make sure you all see the difference there. In some places, seed means children, and, but in these places that I gave you, it means Jesus. Then Abram says back in verse six that he believed the Lord. That's when you go into that's when you go into blood covenant. Is when you believe. I've said this before. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot believe only what you want to believe in the Bible. Many people choose what they don't want to believe in there. Christians don't do that. We believe the whole word of God, the whole word, not just part of it, not the ones that we we like. If we don't like this one, well, I, I don't believe that. Or yeah, well, you got leaders in the church today. I bring them scriptures, and I'm like, well, see what it says right here. And right away, if they don't like it, they'll tell you, oh, that was just for back then. I've had that done to me many times. Yeah. That was just for back then. Well, guess what? That's a lie. The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he meant back then, he means today. He didn't change. In fact, he says in Malachi, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. So people who come with excuses like that, uh, they don't want to believe in whatever that verse is. They'll say, well, that was just for back then. They'll have some kind of reason why they won't accept it. Well, the words of God is, is forever. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The word believe today is weak, though. The word believe means to totally trust and totally commit yourself to the Lord. That's what the word believes, believe means in the Bible. 
to trust and commit. It even means one of that. We see that the Bible, we see in the Bible that the devil and the demons believe in God. So when someone says, "Oh, I believe, I believe in God," that's not telling me anything, because like I said, the devil and the demons believe in God more than we do. They believe in God more than we do because they've seen God in Matthew's chapter 8 verse 28 and 29 and when he was talking about Jesus and when Jesus was come to the other side into the country of Gethsemane there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce so that no man might pass by that way and behold they cried out saying talking to Jesus what have we to do with thee Jesus thou son of God Aren't thou come hither to torment us before the time? So right here the verses are shown. They know the Son of God. They know who Jesus is. So they believe. They believe that Jesus was the Son of God. That's why the Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. Not by what they say. He says you know them by their fruit. The way they walk. They also recognize the scriptures. They know the scriptures. Because they said have you come to put us in hell before our time? How do, how do they know they're going to hell? And when they're going to hell? How do they know that? They know the scriptures. They know what God has said. So right here not only do they believe. But they, they're also showing us that they know the scriptures. Are you coming to put us in hell before our time? So that means they knew. Right? Uh, another place. It shows that the devil quoted scriptures to Jesus also. When he was being tempted. When the devil tempted Jesus for 40 days and 40 nights. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 through 6, it says, Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. So apparently the devil knows what the scripture says, because he's quoting the scripture now. The devil says, For it is written, Ye shall give him his angels charge concerning thee, in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou attach thy foot against a stone. So right here, again, the devil quoted the scriptures. So if you say, if you hear someone say, I'm a believer, I believe in God, and they might even quote scriptures to you, does that mean they're a Christian? Doesn't mean they're a Christian. The devil and the demons did that. Like I just said, it's by their fruits that you know them. Are they walking with the Lord? That's how you know when someone's a Christian. Not by what they say. The difference between them and us. True born again believers. We want to walk with the Lord. We obey God. They didn't. That's the difference between us and them. We see through the scriptures that believing and knowing the scripture doesn't save you. Just doesn't save you. Knowing the scriptures. Believing there is a God. Does not save you. It's giving your heart to him. And totally depending on him. This is why after the rapture. There's still going to be churches going on. Still going to be churches here. And they're still going to have people going to church. I don't like to give a percentage. Because I really don't know. But just say it's. I'm just giving a 50-50. 50% of the people who go to church are lost. They're religious but they're lost. The other 50% are born again Christians. So being a religious person doesn't get you to heaven. Like I said, after the rapture, church will still be going on. And when I say 50%, I'm being nice. I'm being nice here. Because the Lord said broad. Broad is the way to destruction. Meaning there's a lot of people going to hell. He said narrow is the way to, to heaven. Narrow. So that means not too many are, are making it. So when I say 50-50, I'm really being nice here. In John chapter 10 verse 25 through 27. Jesus answered them. I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my father's name. They bear witness of me. But ye believe not. Because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. So that's how you can tell the difference between a religious person and a Christian. A religious person does not follow and obey the Lord. Are y'all listening? A religious person does not obey and follow the Lord. He says, sheep, the, his sheep hear his voice. He's talking about true born again Christians. They hear him. And what do they do? 
they follow him. How do they follow him? How do they know how to follow him? They read his word and obey. You got to read his word and obey him in order to follow him. So born again, born again Christians obey God and follow him. We who believe, we can hear the word of God. We can hear the word of God. We have ears to hear. That's what the Bible says. He who has ears, let him hear. We have ears. Why do we have ears? Because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. But to be in covenant with the Lord, you have to obey and believe. You believe Him and you obey Him. That's being in covenant with God. Don't allow these men who sound so elegant. You got a lot of men out there who sound elegant when they're speaking. And they have all their, these degrees before their name, after their name. Don't let them fool you with their preaching, their teaching, because they sound smart. Like I said before, Moses. Moses went. God sent Moses, and we're going to get on that more, but God sent Moses to Pharaoh. And Moses said, hey, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I'm slow at speech. God said, I can use you. I can use you. You don't have to be an eloquent speaker. Okay, so you got some of these preachers and teachers out there. People believe them because they sound so educated. There's a difference between being educated on college know-how, college learning, and being filled with the Spirit. That's two different kind of preaching there. Being filled with the Spirit is when you, when your Spirit receives what the Word is that's coming at you, you can receive it. But if it's not, if your Spirit is listening, but the one preaching or teaching comes at you, and your Spirit doesn't respond, it's because they're not preaching in the Spirit. They are not preaching or teaching in the Spirit. First John chapter 2, verse 26 and 27, it says, I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit, and He lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what He teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as He has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. Like I just said, the Holy Spirit teaches us. Allow the Holy Spirit to teach you. Don't listen to these men. The Holy, the Holy Spirit does teach by brothers and sisters. I've thought that before. The Holy Spirit uses us to teach others. Uses preachers, uses teachers to teach others. It's the Holy Spirit. Right, right, right now, every time before Bible study starts, I'll ask the Lord to take over my mouth. To take over my lips, my tongue. To let y'all hear only what he has to say, not me. This is not Jesse speaking. I submit myself to the Holy Spirit to teach y'all. So you are being taught by the Holy Spirit, not by Jesse. Okay, y'all understand? First Peter 4.11, it says, For if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm speaking as the oracles of God. This is the scriptures. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. So God has given me this ability. I didn't learn it from, from college, seminaries. I didn't go to anything like that. Okay? What I've learned comes from the Holy Spirit. Not from a man teaching me. I'm talking a man from college. That's what I'm talking about. Now the word abide means to live with. And how can you live with someone if you don't agree with them? See, we we abide in Christ. We live in Him. So how can we live in in Him if we don't believe everything He says? So if you want to live in Christ and Him live in you, we have to agree with everything He says. Everything. Like I said before, Amos 3.3, Can two walk together except they be in agreed? Unless you're in agreement with the Lord on everything He says, we can't walk with Him. So that's very important. I'm really, really pushing that we need to believe everything he says. Without believing everything he says, then you're just riding the fence. And what does Revelation say? If you're just riding the fence, partly you're believing and partly you're not. He said, I'd rather just spit you out of my mouth. Either you're for me or you're against me. Period. That's it. That's what the Word of God says. So you can't just pick what you want to believe. 
in what you don't want to believe. Let me say this. Don't make the mistake and think that you're a great believer in the Lord because you have some kind of great wisdom. That has happened to me when I first got born again. And I really got into the Bible. I really, I really studied a lot. And I started to get a little prideful because a lot of people were coming to me asking me questions because they pretty much thought I knew and instead of me keeping my eyes on the Lord I started putting my eyes on wisdom on knowledge anytime you take your eyes off the Lord I don't care what it I don't care if it's on wisdom and knowledge I don't care what it's on anytime you take your eyes off the Lord you've lost it so don't be caught up in that that you're that you're very knowledgeable and and you start seeking knowledge instead of the Lord. Seek the Lord. He'll give you the knowledge. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 and 31. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy. And he feeds us from sin. Therefore as the scriptures say. If you want to boast. Boast only about the Lord. So right here is it's saying it right here in First Corinthians. If you're going to boast, if you're going to be prideful, be prideful about the Lord. Period. That's it. The Lord has done this. Everybody knows that the Lord has done this. I mean, anybody who knew me before, I was just, I was, I was just a mud ball, nothing. Okay. So what you see here is the Lord, is the Holy Spirit, Jesse. Every now and then, Jesse comes out in the flesh. Every now and then. But I repent, ask for forgiveness, and get back walking with him again. You don't have to be some super saint to know God and understand his words. You don't have to, you don't, some people don't, they depend totally on a man. They don't read the scriptures themselves. They think, oh, this is for the preachers and teachers. No, the scriptures are for all of us to read and learn. We have, they have gifts for preachers and they have gifts for teachers. But all of us are to read the Bible. All of us are to read the Word of God. We should not let, because um, um, I'm telling you, there's a lot of wolves out there. And if you're not reading the Word yourself, you can be deceived. It says in the Bible, it says it's better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in a man. So nobody here has their confidence in me. They have their confidence in the scriptures that I give. That's where the confidence they have. Because if your confidence in, was in me, then I'd have to answer your prayers. I can't answer your prayers. Alright? I can't do that. It says in Hebrews 8.11, From the least to the greatest can believe. From the least person, with, the, with someone who's, you know, not everybody's uh, gifted with intelligence. Smart. Like Jody. She's very intelligent. But then you take someone like me. I just barely graduated. So because Jody's much smarter than me. Doesn't mean she's going to have a. She can understand the Bible better than me. The Lord says right here. From the least to the greatest. Can believe. So Abraham believed God. Same thing with Adam and Eve. They believed. God made a promise and said that. He was going to bring forth a seed. That would defeat the devil. And because of the lies he told Eve, this is the reason the Lord said, no. This is the Lord, like I said, this is his words, okay? This is the reason the Lord said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. It says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to observe authority over the man, but to be silent. For Abraham was first formed, then Eve, and Abraham was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was the transgress transgression. So the Bible plainly saying right here. It wasn't Adam that was deceived by the devil. It was Eve. Eve gave the fruit to Adam to eat. But the deceiver deceived Eve. Which was the devil. He deceived Eve. And because of that the Lord says. From now on I want you to be silent. If I have any uh, Pentecostals out there. Or churches that have women pastors. They've already turned off this teaching. But this is the scriptures, right? What, did, what I've been saying, we need to believe all the scriptures. And the Lord right here plainly says why he said for women to be silent. 
Because Eve is the one that was deceived, not Adam. In Genesis 3, verses 15, 16, and I'm going to read verse 20. It says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. God said that there is going to come a seed from a woman. And who's that seed? Jesus. Jesus. They didn't know what seed meant. When God said that, he's talking to Adam and Eve. There's no children. There was just them too. So when he told them seed, they didn't know what he's talking about. In verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That's another one not too many religions like. The husband shall rule over thee. This is the word of God, okay? I'm just reading you the word of God. They didn't know what children were either. They didn't know what seed meant. They didn't know what children were. Because they never had any at that time. But but Adam believed God. This is what I'm trying to get across. Adam believed, even though Adam couldn't see what he was talking about, but he believed God. And it proved it in the next verse. Verse 20. And Adam called his wife wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now Adam said that before she even had any children. But because God said she was going to have children and it was like, okay, if you say she's going to have children, whatever that is, I believe you. <laughs> huh? I, really, they didn't have children. But God's just not telling them, I go, you're going to have you're going to have children. All right? And, but it says right here, verse 20, And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Before she even had kids, he believed what God said. This is what I'm trying to point out. Believers believe. And even if we don't understand, we believe it. If God said it, we believe it. Amen? Amen. That is a Christian. That is a born-again Christian. We believe what God says. And I've showed you over and over, many, many places where... God told them, and they did it. They didn't know what they were doing, but they did it. That's walking with the Lord. Now back to Genesis 15, verse 7, uh, speaking to Abraham. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the mints, and laid each piece once against another, but the birds divided he not. In earlier teaching, what did I teach on Black Covenant? The animal, you split, them, you split the animal down the middle, and the, <clears throat> and the covenant between men, the two men would, would walk in between the animal and, and so on. But anyway, I'm just showing you this blood covenant is throughout the Bible. It's just not one verse, two verses, or a chapter. It's throughout the Bible. You just put it all together and you'll see what the steps are to being, to being in blood covenant. And this is what the Lord's doing right here. He's telling. Here all the, here all the animals are three years old. Remember, everything in the Old Testament... Everything in the Old Testament is about Jesus, right? Now, all these animals were three years old. How long was Jesus' ministry on earth? Three years. years. All this, I mean, some people might, oh, well, that's just, no. This is the Word of God. He doesn't waste anything here. The Old Testament is all about Jesus, and he's showing it right here. Also, these animals are animals that, that would serve men. They weren't wild animals. Remember in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was wet yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the laws, law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. This is Jesus saying this. Jesus said all this, the books of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, he said all that is about me. Jesus said that. So that's why I tell you, everything in the Old Testament is about Jesus. Amen? Amen. This is the blood covenant, also showing Jesus. 
So Abraham took these animals and cut each of them down the middle and laid them in half, side by side. But he didn't do that with the doves. He didn't do it that way with the doves. And why? Why didn't he do that with the doves? Because doves in the Bible come from the sky. Matthew 3.16 And Jesus, when he was baptized, this is when Jesus was getting baptized, went up straight out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, lightning upon him. So the dove re represents the heavens. So that's why he didn't do this to the, to the doves. In verse 11, he says, And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abraham drove them away. These fowls are not the birds we just read about. These are fowls. Pigeons, birds, that's not. They're different. They're right here saying fowls. Fowls represent the devil. Remember the parable of the seeds? And in Mark 4.4, 4, And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, we're talking about the seeds, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. The fowls of the air devoured up the word of God from whoever was listening to it. Somebody was planting the seed, planting the word of God into someone, witnessing to them. But then the fowl of the air, which is the devil, came down and devoured it. Y'all see, see where I'm coming with that? Yeah. So, fowls and birds, pigeons are not the same. They're different. Here's God in the middle of the blood covenant with Abram. Abram's thinking that God needs his help. Just like we do sometimes. Because he said... The fowls came and Abram drove them away. He's helping God. He drove the, the fowls away. And God is like, Abram, I don't need your help. And But that's what we do. So we can't say nothing about Abram because we do the same thing. Right. Well, I think this is better. I'll do it this way. I, I think it's better. Hmm. God's ways are not our ways, right? His thoughts are not our thoughts. So Abraham's thinking he can help God. He chases the fowls away like God couldn't take care of it. Remember, God does everything in this, in this covenant. God does everything. God didn't need Abraham's help. In verse 12, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. Now God, like I said, God's saying, Abram, go to sleep. I don't need your help. God put Abraham to sleep, Abram to sleep. This great hall that Abram felt is in verse 17. So let's drop down to verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. What pieces? The animals, right? Yeah. Okay. The two objects passing through the carcass wasn't Abraham and God. Even though God's going into covenant with Abraham, no, no, don't let me lose you. Even though God's going into covenant with Abraham, it was not Abraham and God that was walking between there. The reason is because if Abraham would have broken the covenant, we would not have a covenant with the Lord. If they break it up here, then it doesn't go no further. So God didn't go into Abraham, go into covenant with Abraham, because like I said, if he would have broke it, we'd be lost. But it was God and Abraham. Remember, this is a vision Abraham is having. Remember, it's a vision. God is using the smoking furnace and the burning lamp to represent him, God, walking between the two pieces. But this covenant was between God and Jesus. Remember, it was a vision. It was Jesus and God that walked through the, through the animal. Because God made a perfect God, made a covenant with a perfect man. Jesus. So he made it. He had, he had Abraham, Abraham have a vision, and it wasn't Abraham. It was Jesus and God that walked through the animal. Because God cannot make go into covenant with a sinner. Y'all get me? Right, right. So God wanted to have covenant with man, but it had he had to make that covenant with a perfect man. So that's why it was Jesus. This is a vision. That's why it was Jesus and God that went that walked through the animal. To have a perfect covenant, it had to be a perfect God and a perfect man. And that man was Jesus. 
Now you might ask, how do we know this was Jesus? You might ask that. Well, that's why we read the Bible. We just If you don't get the answer over here, just keep reading. And you might have to read quite a ways before you get the answer. But the answer is, it's in John. Chapter 8, verse 56 through 58. It says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. This is Jesus speaking. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. How hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus was shown, Before, even, before Abraham was even born, I was there. So Abram, Abram, Abram saw Jesus and rejoiced. Where did he see Jesus? He saw Jesus in this vision. Amen? Amen. Do you see? Do you understand that now? This is where how how else could have Abraham saw Jesus and rejoice? And you have to go all the way back to the Old Testament to see. Okay, Abram had a vision, and this vision that's what it was. I mean, what else could this verse, these verses in John, what else could they mean when he saw when Abraham saw Jesus? What else could they mean? This is part of the covenant. God said, "I'll supply everything you need. I supply everything you need." You need rest? I'm going to give you rest. Just put your eyes on me. Amen. That's it. Let the world have all this stress, depression, and all that. Let the world have that. Let them have ulcers and all that. I'm here to give you peace. I'm here to give you rest. I'm in covenant with you. I will give you whatever you need. This is God. This is what God has told us. What's our job? To believe it. To believe it. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. A new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, meaning depending on yourself, and I will give you a heart of flesh. He's removing the stony heart from our body and replacing it with a heart that's going to be after God's own heart, is what he's saying here. And I will put my spirit within you, which is the Holy Spirit, and cause you to walk in my statutes, his authority, and you shall keep my judgments, which means commands, and do them. This is what happens when we go into covenant with the Lord. He gives us the Holy Spirit, all the power we need. The, the Holy Spirit gives us power. Acts 1 8 says, I, and, you re- and you will receive power. This is the Holy Spirit. Trust in his authority, trust that he is God. Trust Him that He is God and we're just man. We're just people. That's what He said. He says, I'm going to be your God. You just be people. And then He says judgments. Commands. He says to do them. Do my commands. That's what He's saying. In verse 18, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed, Have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So we see God made a covenant with Abram. He doesn't show all the steps here, but in other phases we can put all the accounts together and see that this is a blood covenant, a step-by-step thing. We'll see in chapter 17 that the Lord changed Abram, or changed his name, to Abraham. That's part of the covenant, right? He changes your name. And the cutting of their hands was different. They didn't cut their hands here, like it meant, like the covenant between men, how they cut their palms with their hand. Remember? Well, right here he did it different. But in Genesis 17, verses 4 and 5, 11 and 13, verse 4: As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be any more called Abram, but thy name shall be called shall be Abraham. For father of many nations I have made thee. Then verse 11. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Verse 13. All must be circumcised. Your bodies will bear the mark of my everlasting covenant. So why would men cut their, their, their palms? To leave a mark, to leave a score, to remember they're in covenant. For right here, God told the Jews, he told Israel, he told Abraham... He says, I want y'all to cut the foreskin. That's be, to be circumcised. All the males. That was their, their that was their mark. 
Just like I said, the, the man had the palm right here. It was different. But it's all blood covenant. There had to be blood. And this is the way he did it with the Jews back then. Now back in verse 5, God said to him, You're going to have many, so many children. And he did. Right? In verse 7, God said, I'm going to give you a nation to inherit it. And he did. Amen? Amen. God blessed Abraham with seed that would give hope to make it to heaven. Did he give us that seed? Right. Our hope to make it to heaven is who? Jesus. Jesus. So that seed he spoke about did come and we now have it. So everything he promised Abraham has happened. You can believe a God like that. Yeah. He will, when he makes a promise, he'll keep it. That's our God. Abraham was so blessed, here it is a thousand years later, and we're still talking about him. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Everything was going on in Israel was pretty good. From Abraham, after the covenant, everything that the Israel and the Jews were doing were pretty good. You know, they were walking with the Lord. And then the story of Joseph comes. Joseph and his 11 brothers. They, this, we're up to that point now. Okay? Now, Joseph and his 11 brothers didn't like Joseph because Joseph was close to the daddy. He obeyed his daddy. He was close to him. And his 11 brothers didn't like it. So they did what they did. I'm not going to go through all that. But Joseph ended, ended up where? In Egypt. And at first it wasn't good for him. But then he interpreted a dream for a Pharaoh there. And uh, he got real close to him. So Joseph became a mighty man in Egypt. And they had a famine in Israel. Everybody was going hungry. So his brothers came to Egypt. And they didn't know Joseph was, was there. They thought he was dead. Came to Egypt. Saw Joseph. They thought they were, that Joseph was going to curse him. Or put him to death or whatever. No. Joseph is a Christian man. From the very beginning. He loved his daddy. He obeyed his daddy. He was a Christian man. He forgave his brothers and accepted them and fed them, bought them. So Israel, Jews, they all started moving to Egypt. And they got, they grew pretty big as a nation. Okay, everything's going good right now in Egypt. But Joseph and his brother die. And in Exodus chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. And Joseph and all his brethren and all that generation and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. And multiplied, waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt. The old king was in favor of Joseph, okay? Because Joseph uh, interpreted a dream for him, so he made Joseph a mighty man. But now this king is dead. Now they got a new king. And Egypt, I mean, uh, the Jews are really growing rapidly, it says. Which knew not Joseph? This king didn't know Joseph. Verse 9, And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more mightier than we. Then in verse 11, The Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. Now that's how they became slaves in Egypt. So they've been, in, they've been slaves in Egypt. And then 400 years has gone by. Okay, I'm skipping here because we're just going on covenant. 400 years went by. Moses and Aaron became the new godly leaders. In Exodus 2, verse 23 to 25. 23, verse 23. Years passed, and the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. So they cried out to the Lord. The Lord heard their cry. And he acted on it. And he didn't act on it because they deserved it. Oh, they're, they're being so holy down there. They, you know, they're walking in my ways. Blah, blah. No, no. Israel was not. But he heard their cries. He remembers he had a covenant with the father, their grandfather. Great, great grandfather or whatever. And he says, okay, I got to act on this. Because we're in covenant. Because they were living in an adultery they were worshiping other gods. So like I said, God did not do this because they deserved it. Same thing with us, right? Can anybody in this room say, I deserve to go to heaven? Can anybody come even close to saying that? No. Well, just like here. The Jews did not deserve it, 
but he came because he had a covenant. He answered their, their prayer because of the blood covenant he had with Abraham. And Moses continued the covenant with God and the first step of being in covenant is believing. And Moses believed and he knows that he was he has God's strength because that's one of the things you get, right? In the covenant you get the strength behind him. There was no small task. A slave going to a king and telling him God said let his people go. Remember, God told Moses I want you to go to Pharaoh, the king and tell him let my people go. Now this is a slave. You know, He's a slave. And God told him, go to this king. Now, in our lives today, when God tells us something that looks like, yeah, right, do we do it? Or are we like, man, I can't do that. Most of us wouldn't have done what Moses did. Moses, most of us would have been the opposite of Moses. We would have been the opposite of him. We would have said, well, I don't think so. I'm not going to a king. He'll behead me. Because a king did whatever they wanted. But Moses knew he had the strength of God. Amen? Amen. So when, God, when something comes upon you, listen to me. When something comes upon you and it looks too, too mighty to overcome and you can't do it, who is your strength? This is the main thing we learn in the, in the covenant. God is your strength now. Amen. No matter what he tells you to do, no matter, do it. Just believe him and do it. Just like Moses did here. He went to a king who could have had him beheaded if he wanted. But God was with him. God tells Moses in Exodus chapter 3 verses 7 through 10. He's heard the cries of the people and he's going to rescue them. In Exodus 5 1. And afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel let my people go. That they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Pharaoh laughed at Moses and Aaron. This is what people do. When you tell them something about the Lord, you know, God said, you know, God says you can have salvation. All you have to do is repent, confess to Him, give Him your heart, and you can go to heaven. Some people laugh at that. I mean, I'm, if, you, if you've done any kind of witnessing, you'll know that. They laugh at what we say. But well, this is what Pharaoh did. Because of that, many curses were brought on Egypt. And every time Pharaoh disobeyed God, he gave him another curse. Then he got to the last curse, which was the which was the worst of them all. The last curse, Exodus chapter eleven, verse four through five. And Moses said, "Thus saith the Lord: About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maid servants that is behind the mill." And all the firstborn of the beasts. What did I say before? When you mess with someone that's in covenant with the Lord. So when you mess with a Christian. God's people. Look what can happen. Look what he did to Egypt. He brought many plagues. Then finally he brought the worst one. Had all the, had the king's firstborn to die. So people who. I'm, listen to me. People who mess with us. They're messing with God. I've told you that before. We're in covenant with God. That's why we don't have to worry. If people are cursing us and everything, let them. They're going to bring the wrath of God on themselves. We don't have to do anything to them. God's going to take care of them. Amen? This is the covenant we have with the Lord. He takes care of us. If we can only get that through our our little mind that we have, if we can get that through our head, God will take care of us no matter what. He did it with with the uh, with the uh, Israel here. There were slaves in Egypt, and God heard their cry. And what did he do? He answered their cry, and he took over. He acted on. Oh, you're the one who's been putting my people under slavery. Let them go, or else. Well, they didn't let them go. So God did all this to them because he was messing with God's people. Pharaoh was messing with God's people, and we can. We can look at it the same way today. I mean, we don't go, we don't go, if someone's messing with us, we don't go, ooh, God's going to strike you dead. <laughs> no, we don't do that. That's a bad attitude. That's the wrong attitude. But we'll, we'll know, but we do know, man, you better be careful. Right. You better be careful. We don't, feel, we don't want this to happen to them. 
Because God said what? God said, love your enemies. We're supposed to love this person. Whoever's attacking us, whoever's talking about us, God said, love them. And if they don't change, God will deal with them. Right? He will. He brought them out of Egypt to the promised land. Psalms 105, verse 42 and 45. This is why he took them out of it. For he remembered his holy promise to servant Abraham, right? But also in verse 45, And this happened so they would follow his authority and obey his instructions. Praise the Lord. That's why he brought them out of Egypt, so they would follow him, Almighty God, so they would follow him and obey him. That's why he brought them out. The Jews were always up and down in their walk with the Lord. Exodus 24, 7. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said will, said, will we do and be obedient. So the Jews said, they said, okay, everything you've said, we will be obedient. We know that it didn't last very long. That didn't last very long. But still, listen to me, still, we can't look... We can't look at, and I used to, I used to look at the Jews, man, they're idiots. <laughs> but then as, as I walked through my life with the Lord, I'm an idiot too. God did this for me over here, and then I'm, I run across something over here, and I forget all what he, what he did over here. I forget how mighty he is, I forget how much strength he has, and I forget he is God. He is God. I mean, when, when it hit y'all, it's going to hit y'all. It hasn't hit y'all yet. But when he hit you, who God is, and when you're in covenant with him, I'm in here. Because somebody's going to holler. And they're not going to just say, Amen. No, somebody's going to holler. When they finally comprehend and take it in, that God is your strength, and he will take care of everything. Everything. I can't say that enough. Everything. You got a problem? Take it to God. He will. Not might. He will take care of it.